These are Europe's leading data centers. Flexible and transparent, resilient and secure. Connecting the world's businesses, big and small, to fiber, broadband, mobile, and content distribution networks. Housing cloud service operators, generating new efficient digital opportunities. Helping enterprises keep mission critical IT infrastructure running. Ensuring content providers can reach their customers. These are the experts that you can rely on to complete your installs, to maintain the data centers 24-7, 365 days a year. So, this is our commitment to you to run outstanding energy-efficient data centers in prime European city center locations operated by our expert staff. From Fortune 500 to startup, the companies you rely on rely on us. We are Telecity Group, outstanding data centers, expertise you can trust. Morning. Can everybody hear me? Good. Um, thank you very much for having me here. I apologize that I don't speak Polish. I've seen Polish people come all the way to England, to America, and present in English, and here I am coming to Poland, and I'm also speaking English. Um, I do speak one other language, but it's nothing that will help me here, so I will stick to the English, and I've already been told to speak slowly, so I will try my best. If anybody doesn't understand something, then um, I've left some time for questions. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the company, but not very much. Uh, I would also like to spend most of the time speaking about a particular problem we have and how we solve these problems. Our data centers tend to be in very urban locations and city centers. This is where our customer base is. And uh, constructing the data centers in places like this has its own kind of challenges. Just an overview of where we are. Um, you can see we are in very many European locations. Um, and the graphic shows some of the more landmark buildings, some of them easy to recognize and others less so easy to recognize. Uh, the most rec recent acquisitions are in... Um, louder? Not here, but I'm sure these guys can. Move this closer. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yeah? Better? Now it's too loud, huh? Okay, moving on. Uh, just a breakdown of our European locations. You can see that um, the data centers are positioned fairly central all around Europe. The one which I'm going to spend more time speaking about today is. Uh, the London Docklands location, which is, which is here, second to right on the top. Uh, and this is where we have a, a particular challenge with our urban location and the proximity to other kinds of building. And there are the other locations, Frankfurt, Stockholm, Helsinki, Istanbul, through to Sofia and Warsaw. And the big expansion area of our company at the moment is around Eastern Europe. Uh, so. It's a good opportunity to come to speak at the PNL today. This is our growth platform. Just a quick summary. Uh, we already have just under 100 megawatts of operational capacity uh, with a further 50-odd megawatts of announced capacity. Um, we do have a strong growth strategy, which is organic growth strategy. Our customer base tends to be a group of uh, individuals looking to access a local high bandwidth customer base, which again leads to the inner city locations. The graph at the bottom effectively tells us that the 
European market is significantly larger than the UK market, so although we are a UK listed company, uh, Europe is the more important location for us. Here's a breakdown of that expansion of the 50 megawatts I mentioned. So a fairly large amount of it is in London, Amsterdam is also very large. So a total of 20 megawatts expansion in London, 9 megawatts in Amsterdam, Frankfurt a further 4, Dublin 8, Manchester. And here, some of the more recent locations we have, um, Helsinki, Stockholm, Istanbul, Sofia with Warsaw, uh, with a further one megawatt expansion, which is ongoing presently. So now if we can talk about inner city data centers and some of the challenges that these pose for us, which is really what I wanted to present to you today. Um, this particular location is the Canary Wharf area in Docklands. It's, uh, it's a banking sector. Most of the financial services companies are present here. Um, so you can see the high-rise buildings in the upper center of the photograph there uh, is effectively the financial center. It's one of the two financial centers of London. Uh, and our data centers are positioned around these. Now, these are where our customers are, and, uh, and this is where we also construct a, a number of our data centers. And what makes it even more complicated is that we have not only commercial, but residential buildings immediately adjacent. So from this aerial photograph, you can see we have on the top with the red line, we have our first data center, which is called Harbor Exchange in the Canary Wharf area. Immediately to the left, we have office and commercial, and immediately to the right and behind, we actually have residential, uh, which is a uh, modern high-rise apartment complex. And so you can imagine that emissions in general become an issue. You know, we can't generate too much noise, especially not at night. Uh, we cannot emit substances into the atmosphere. And also, in an inner city location, the conservation of drinking water um, is very important. It's important for corporate social responsibility. If there is a water shortage, if there's a drought and a shortage of drinking water, then if you're evaporating thousands of litres a day uh, to cool your data centre, you can become quite unpopular fairly quickly. On the lower side of the dock to the right, we have our second position, which is prospective. This will be a new build project. And again, it's exactly the same situation. You know, to the left and underneath, we have residential buildings. And to the right, we have commercial. Yeah, so we're not in the situation where we can choose where to build our data center, uh, and we can, we, can, we can pick the perfect location with the perfect uh, environmental conditions. We have to construct them where our customers are. This is the location at the top of the last diagram. Uh, it's uh, the Harbour Exchange Center, which is a zoom in, which is being expanded currently. One thing you'll notice immediately from the photograph is that the roof is quite full. It's a high-rise building, um, mostly occupied with data center area. And it's very difficult to expand this because the roof is already almost fully occupied with cooling plant. Uh, if anyone's wondering what the green patch in the middle is, you see the little green roof? Um, the building in the center is actually a newly constructed plant building, and it's full of diesel generators and transformers. Um, and one requirement of the planning application was to have a, a grass roof, so we have a grass roof on the generator building, which does look a little strange compared to the rest of the roof. But it's an, an idiosyncrasy of, of inner city planning conditions. So the challenge here, really, you can imagine with apartment blocks being constructed left and right of our data center, you know, to keep the noise down and to keep the visual impact down with this kind of a building is, is, is not easy. You know, so we really have to think about what our possibilities are to do that. Because sustainability is not only about PUE, there's been a big focus on PUE and energy efficiency, but it, it's more than that. You know, fitting in with the environment also means not detrimenting the value of adjacent buildings. You know, so if private people are buying apartments nearby, then the value of the apartment is affected if there's a very industrial looking building next door, um, as well as if there are emissions, noise, and other, other factors. Uh, this is the second prospective location. The green line indicates where the building will be constructed. Uh, we have a similar situation. It is, a, it is still classified as a high-rise building, so we have limited roof area, and immediately to the right, there's a very large, quite expensive block of modern flats, um, and on the adjacent condition as well. The body of water at the front of the diagram is what I'll be focusing on um, with regard to the energy concept. 
Um, so just summarizing the, the things to be concerned about when constructing an inner city data center. We have acoustics and noise, we have emissions. Use of chemicals is a major one, um, which is connected to drinking water conservation. Uh, so if we take drinking water and we put biocides in it, we put rust inhibitors in it, and then we evaporate it. We evaporate it until the concentration of these chemicals becomes too high and it starts attacking the metal material of our systems and then we dump it into the drain. That's not particularly environmentally friendly. Uh, so water conservation is an important aspect, particularly in inner city environments where, where the priority really has to be the people. Then we have effect on wildlife and residents. Visual impact I touched on earlier. And we have heat recovery and energy conservation, uh, which is connected to contributions to district energy schemes. Um, so, I mean, looking into the future, if, if data centers are to be sustainable and environmentally friendly, then we have to have a form of energy sharing and energy recovery. It's not environmentally friendly to build a data center in the Arctic region on top of a frozen lake um, and throw the heat away. What is more environmentally friendly is if we have a, a consolidated planning philosophy. So we could have a thermal power station which has low-grade steam, the low-grade steam moves into the data center. The data center has an absorption cooling process, then we have hot water emerging from the data center. That energy is then transferred to the next stage, which can then be heating for apartments, fitness centers, swimming pools, community projects, and, and so further and so forth. We're not really in the situation anywhere around Europe yet that data centers are an integral part of the city planning. Yeah. And this is something which we're looking to, to move towards. And this really is a, is a strong argument for the co-location data center. You know, th this kind of a concept is impossible if everybody is out there building their own data center. Um, if you come to a, a large consolidated co-location data center, then it can be incorporated into the city planning and we can address all these issues more effectively. Uh, the diagram on the right-hand side is, is from the uh, Green Grid, which is an organization which, which we do support. Um, it talks about direct free cooling uh, free cooling is a term which people normally associate with, 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 with the atmospheric temperature, rejecting the heat from the data center to the atmosphere. It doesn't have to be to the, to the atmosphere. Uh, direct free cooling means that you effectively take the old cold air from outside, put it into the data center, take the warm air from the data center and put it outside. So that means that you have to filter the air, um, which is a little bit limiting. You know, the definition of a filter is that it has holes in it, otherwise no air gets through. And if you have a very fine filter, then you'll spend more energy and fan energy pressing the air through the filter than you would have saved had you had a mechanical system. Yeah, so the filtering is really limited to, to anti-polymers, to, to things like pollen, larger particles, which means that you have a certain amount of, of ingress from whatever is outside to inside. Can be problematic if there is smoke, uh, smog, a certain degree of pollution, um, a fire, anywhere nearby, then, then that leads people to what we call indirect free cooling, where you exchange the air over a heat exchanger. Okay? You, so you lose a couple of degrees, and this changes the diagram. If you have indif indirect free cooling, then the colors in the diagram kind of move to the top. And the other consequence is that we have a lot of plant space. Now, so if you were to use air indirect via air heat exchangers, then we have very, very large plant areas. So a large proportion of the volume of the building is for air handling plant, which doesn't really suit an inner city location. Real estate is very expensive. We pay a lot for the buildings. We want to offer as much to the customer as possible. Uh, so they're losing a lot of space to, 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 to plant because we're using air as, a, as an energy transfer medium um, is not, for us, really a particularly good idea. So that's why I don't mind telling you we haven't built a single uh, air-based free cooling data center. Uh, if you look at the diagram, you can also see that it's not suited, even if you do, were to follow this route, it's not suited to everywhere in Europe. You know, the southern parts of Europe don't work anyway, which you could argue is because there's not much going on, but that's a fairly short-term view. If you look further east to Sofia, Istanbul, there's a lot going on, and we need to find a new concept there anyway. And you can also see that it doesn't work for the, the full year. There are 8,700 hours in the year, round about, um, and unless you live at the very north of Europe, then for some part of the year you'll have to have either a supplementary adiabatic cooling or a mechanical cooling system. So what do we do? The first consideration really is to move away from, from air. So air has a very low specific heat. It's not good at 
transporting heat energy. Now, if you want to move large amounts of heat around, then air is not the first choice of any engineer that I'm aware of. Uh, a high specific heat comes with water. So the bottom three options, ocean water cooling, geothermal cooling systems, or river and canal water cooling, are more realistic. And the nice thing, as you'll see later in the presentation, about water-based cooling is that the temperature profile over the year um, is far more constant than the atmospheric temperature profile. So what we considered for this particular location is dock water cooling. And I chose this because, because it required a certain amount of discipline in our team. The, we haven't got the situation in Canary Wharf um, where we have a moving body of water and we don't have a very large body of water. For example, where I come from in New Zealand, there are fjords, which are up to two or 300 metres deep. The water comes from the glacier, so it's very cold. Uh, there's no issue with the water temperature. Um, we can put a lot of heat into the water and not affect the temperature of the water. And after you've put your heat into the water, the water moves along. It moves somewhere else, and, and, and it's not really your problem anymore. There's more water coming behind it. And it's not difficult to make that work. Um, what is more difficult is to make a stagnant body of water work, which is what this is. The water level is regulated from the Thames River, but it is constant. So if we put heat into the water, then the heat, we have to wait for the heat to dissipate, dissipate to atmosphere. And this is really what makes it a challenge, which is why I thought I would, I would talk about it with you today. So the effects on the dock water, the body of water we have, we investigated the water temperature and the quality at positions and depths in the dock. This is really the basis of the study, to find out if it really suits us at all. Uh, we investigated the factors that influence the dock temperature and the heat rejection ability. And we determined the effect of the data center on the dock water, you know, to confirm if it is sustainable. Would we be affecting wildlife in the water, the fish, the birds? Uh, would we be raising the temperature? Would there be an increase in, in microorganisms? From the diagram, you can see the different effects on the water body itself, the most significant of which is the solar radiation, which I'll explain a little bit more later on. So the first part of the study was to take measurements. Uh, what the two graphs are here, we can see the temperature of the dot water at varying depths, uh, which is the diagram on the left. And you can see as you go deeper into the dock, you can see that, there's a, that the water temperature drops significantly you know, from 13 degrees all the way down to 8 degrees. However, on the right-hand side, you can see that the salinity of the water, this is the salt content of the water, also changes. So the deeper you go, from 6 metres onwards, there's a dramatic increase in salinity. Uh, and there is also something which we call suspended particles. The water near the bottom of the dock is it's full of suspended particles, it's, it's, um, it's not clear, which means that we will have maintenance problems. If we take that water into our system, then we have increased filtering, uh, we have the buildup of scale. So that's why we selected for our system at the depth of exactly six meters, which is before the salinity starts to increase. The water does still have some salt content, it's a mixture of seawater and river water, but it's at a level where we can prevent scale buildup via the velocity of the water. So we keep the water moving fast enough through our system that we don't get a buildup of scale. <clears throat> and the reason the temperature is so critical, of course, is because we're focusing on, on free cooling. This one is particularly relevant. The diagram on this page addresses the, the variance in temperature over the year. Um, so during the summer period, you can see that the temperature of the water comes up to around about 20 degrees, which is a higher temperature than you would strictly use for free cooling. We're designing the system so that we can have full free cooling below or at a dock water temperature of 17 degrees C. So the chilled water degrees inside the data center itself are 19 degrees. And this diagram shows that for more than 75% of the year, this is the case. Yeah. So for 75% of the year, we can have full free cooling in the data center using the dock water. And for the period above that, we would actually have partial free cooling. So then we would have the dock water providing a pre-cooling or partial cooling, and we would top that up uh, with mechanical cooling over the summer period. The, 
The reason for this significant increase in temperature really brings us back to, to the fact that this is a stagnant body of water. Yeah, and the largest contributor is the solar effect. Uh, if we look at the cumulative temperatures, which is the next diagram, uh, here we can see the proportion of the year uh, during which we have free cooling. Um, uh, we have a proportion of the year where we have partial free cooling. Um, and as you can see on the right-hand side, we would never require full mechanical cooling. So there's enormous reduction in the amount of mechanical plant that we would require for the data center. We need to focus on the average depth, which is the red trace in the diagram. So this is a CFD study, um, and this is where we started to look at what would happen to the body of water after we start contributing heat energy into it. So it looks like there's a fairly significant effect, because you can see some bright colors there. The green color look, indicates around about a five degrees delta in temperature. But this is at the surface of the dock. Okay, so the average temperature and the temperature underneath the water um, is lower. And I guess what we're trying to do here is we actually, rather than having a small area such as a dry cooler or a cooling tower where we, where we have a very small area, surface area, and we compensate that with a high flow rate of air to, to, to transfer heat energy, we're actually using the surface area of the dock as the heat exchanger. Uh, which you can imagine is where we save the energy because we don't have the fan power. So we have around about a five degree temperature increase on the surface. This is based on a 10 megawatt total heat contribution. Yeah, so it's not a small amount, it's a, it, it, it's a lot of energy. Uh, here we have the traces which indicate the average temperature contribution. So the five degree temperature increase you saw is right at the top of the diagram here. And that's how we can tell that it's only at the surface of the water and not at the average depth. The average temperature change is under two degrees. Now, so even with a, if you look at the green trace, the red trace is, uh, is, is an absolute maximum. The green trace is, the, is close to the allowable figure according to the environmental agency. And the blue trace is really what we're looking at realistically building. Yeah. So you can see that we're actually only affecting the temperature of the dock by around about one degree. Yeah. So the maximum temperature change according to the environmental quality standard is 3.5 degrees based on protection of wildlife. Um, and the total allowable discharge into the dock is 15 megawatts. So what this really tells us is that our scheme with the temperatures that we're looking to use fits nicely into the environmental concept for the dock water. Um, so after we start contributing heat, this is a scaled diagram on the, on the axis at the bottom. Uh, as we increase the heat input into the dock, you can see that we decrease the proportion of the year during which the temperature remains below 17 degrees. Yeah, so it's a bit of a vicious circle. The more heat you put in, the higher the temperature, the less you get out. Yeah? So we really have to find the right balance that works with this particular volume of water. Uh, the other traces, the blue and the green, uh, give us the mean temperature increase and the maximum surface temperature of the dock. So if we take the eight uh, megawatt input, which is where the two lines meet, then you can see that our full free cooling uh, has dropped from 75% of the year down to approximately 66% of the year because we are also contributing to the heat energy of the dock. It's not only the solar energy uh, as the main contributor, but also the data center. We then did 3D modeling on the, the plume study. Yeah, so as you can see, this is, this is far and above um, a simple uh, environmental concept. And the purpose of the plume study is to, is to, is to work out whether we, we would be affecting the migration of organisms across the dock, uh, such as fish or birds or other small organisms as they move across the body of water. We originally wanted to discharge at an angle of 30 degrees to increase the mixing. Um, this causes an increased heat dissipation but lowers the surface temperature. And the surface temperature is actually where the exchange of heat takes place. So it's actually better to have a higher temperature at the surface and to protect the body of water underneath. Um, what it also does is introduces a heating effect at the intake. So if you can see the red 
and the green is the discharge of the warm water, which is leaving the data center with the heat energy. Um, we also have to have a supply connection. Um, and we wanted to supply at a depth of six meters, if you remember from earlier on in the presentation. So that becomes difficult because we, have, because we have this mixing effect. We would effectively be drawing in warmer water because we're drawing warm water close to the discharge. So we found that if we, if we discharge at a high level, um, at a zero degree angle, then the water rises on its own to the surface, increases the heat exchange to atmosphere, and at the depth of six meters, that's where we have our connection for the replacement water, which means we no longer have mixing uh, and we can take the lowest possible water temperature from the dock into our data center. Uh, this is really just a diagram showing the two locations in purple on the right-hand side, um, with the DC1, DC2, Harbour Exchange and Glen Glenwell Bridge. Uh, what we did next was an energy cost comparison. So after checking the environmental requirements, the characteristics of the water, the suitability for, for use with our data center, um, under the understanding that this will cost a certain amount of money, uh, we did a comparison with a typical data center scheme. This is an idea of, or well, a very simplified schematic of, of how the, the system works. Uh, the diagram on the bottom right, you can see at very low level on the three-dimensional drawing, you can see these, that is effectively the intake connection at a depth of six meters. Um, we draw the, the water into the data center, goes through a heat exchanger, and then it's returned to the dock. It's just a, a simple circulation process. Uh, what's not shown on the schematic is that we do also remove heat from the data center first and supply it to the apartments in the form of district heating. Yeah, so the amount of heat that people don't want, so we can't use it. So for example, in summer, in the summer condition where people aren't looking to heat their apartments, etc., cetera, um, then we have a larger heat, heat contribution that then goes into the heat exchanger and, uh, and into the body of dock water. Uh, the intake itself has a self-cleaning screen. You can imagine that this isn't clean water. It's very salty. It does have a certain amount of particles in it. Um, and the way that works is, is we have this permanently rotating cleaning mechanism. Uh, there is water being, there's water being forced out of the intake nozzle, which, which on the right-hand side, you can see the red, the, the red pipe work, which is rotating, and that effectively cleans via a pressure wave um, the filter mesh, and that's rotating around constantly. And where th these two blades are not cleaning the mesh, we have an intake of water um, in a perpendicular angle. No. And so this is how we avoid clogging and constant cleaning of these, of these filters. It's quite a clever system. So here we have an indication of, of how much energy we would be using with an air-cooled chiller system, uh, which would look similar to the photographs I showed at the start of the presentation, where we have all this fairly intensive roof-mounted plant. We would have an annualized PUE in that condition of 1.45. And you can see the dock water scheme has an annualized PUE of 1.21. And that's indicated in the diagram with the red and the blue traces. So th what's not really shown in the diagram is the cost of the dock water itself. Before we move on from this, um, I would just point out the slightly unusual shape of the diagram. I mean, they, the, the temperature data of any particular location is normally a, a kind of a bell curve. And the reason why you've got this big chunk uh, bitten out of the top of the red curve, if you can see that, um, is because with a modern compressor, turbo core type chiller, first of all, the system runs as long as it can on the free cooling. And then when the chiller actually finally does start, we actually have a decrease in electrical energy. Uh, and that's because the chiller is more efficient than, than, than the fans running at full speed at, at, at roof level. So after the chiller starts, um, the cooling water temperature increases significantly, up to 45 degrees, which compared to atmosphere is significantly warmer. There's a bigger delta in the temperature, which means the fans at roof level drop in their speed, and that's why you have this. Um, that can be flattened out with, with, with better tuning, 
but it's a typical characteristic for the standard setup. And what the dock water cooling does with its pre-cooling is even in summer when the temperature of the water is quite high, we can pre-cool. Um, so it moves that, that, high, that entire characteristic over to the right, which is a very significant energy saving. So in rough terms, using an average uh, electricity price, um, and once we've included the cost of the water itself, um, we end up with a, around about 350,000 pound cost difference based on the 10 megawatt uh, data center load. Um, so it does turn out to be quite e economical. It's expensive in terms of the design. Uh, we need to make sure we factor in enough time t to look at things properly. It's not a, it's the situation where you can carbon copy data centers and build one after the other. You know, inner city data centers have, have their own characteristics. You know? And so this one in particular, by being able to realize this, we solve other problems. It's not really about the energy saving in terms of money. It's, it's about the fact that we don't have the visual impact on the roof of the building. We don't have the noise impact. Uh, we don't have to spend anything like as much on, on acoustics, which then makes the building higher, more difficult to get a planning approval, bulkier, and overall visually unpleasant. In terms of our environmental policies, uh, something we take quite seriously, and we do consider it to be a one of the motivators for, for people to, to come to our co-location data centers. Uh, we did support um, and fund the EU code of contact for data centers, um, where ISO 14001 accredited. Uh, we're a member of the Carbon Trust Standard, uh, and we also belong to the Green Grid. Uh, we also, also won a number of awards for our data centers, our people policies, uh, including environmental standards. We won the energy efficiency category at the, at the uh, National E-Wellbeing Awards in 2010. Uh, we won the Data Center Dynamics Leaders Award in 2010 for improved data center energy efficiency. And we won Co-Location Provider of the Year at the International Data Center and Cloud Awards 2013. Included also in the FTSE 4 Good Index, if you've heard of that. Then we have our environmental standards, which I won't go through in particular detail. Um, what's a little more interesting is the engagement with the industry, uh, protecting customers, uh, protecting copyright holders, and we're CP&I audited audit as well. So I had allowed up to 10 minutes for questions, if anybody wants to ask any questions about the dock water cooling. Nope, in that case, oh, there's one. No, I just want to push our people to ask the question. So, jakieś pytania? Hello, thank you for the interesting presentation. I've got one question. Uh, in terms of our uh, Polish location here in Warsaw, have you ever considered uh, moving or uh, establishing a data center near our bank of the river? Because we've got a river here in Warsaw, definitely. So maybe it will be uh, more efficient to locate the data center uh, near the bank of the river than uh, here in the center of the city, which is definitely strategic location, but in terms of this uh, cooling, uh, water cooling system. Yes, um, it's something which, which we would look at. We have looked at that recently in Frankfurt. Um, the reason why we haven't chosen it in Frankfurt, I can tell you, is because uh, the location is not only decided on the environmental concept, it's also the connectivity, the infrastructure has to be, has to be present. The other thing which tends to be the case for uh, waterside locations is that they are incredibly expensive and the preference of the town planning department is to build high value residential properties because of the view over the water. Yeah. There are exceptions, um, particularly in established European cities, you often find that you have a power station on the river which rejects its heat into, into the river. Um, in Frankfurt, um, all of the above was the case. And in addition to that, the water temperature in the summer exceeded 23 degrees Celsius. Um, and a significant contributor to that fact was the thermal power station, which was, uh, which was upstream of our, 
of our prospective location. So we had a location where we could afford the land because it wasn't um, extremely high value residential property. We could possibly have received a planning permit because it was still a mixed use area and not purely residential or purely commercial. Um, but the other factors didn't work out. The, the connectivity and the temperature of the water didn't work out. Um, so we really have to look at and see what we can make the best of. You know, the inner city data centers, they are where they have to be. Um, and, and if they weren't, uh, we'd build them somewhere completely different. Jeszcze pytania? Are there any questions? Jeśli nie ma żadnych dodatkowych pytań, podziękujemy serdecznie za fascynujący wykład. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, all energy used by IT equipment in the data halls themselves is converted to heat. And uh, if left unchecked, this heat will accumulate and cause an over-temperature in the data center. So the two highest risk of failure in a data center are either electrical supply failure or over-temperature. So it's extremely important to have a good, reliable cooling system. The environmental strategy of a data center is extremely dependent on the cooling solution. We're in our Suvalati data center in Helsinki, and this particular room here is the seawater heat exchange center. While many people have heard of the concept of free cooling, and free cooling really means that you're using some means of ambient temperature to get rid of the heat in your data center. And many people think this is uh, typically the atmosphere, and it can be the atmosphere. Another form of free cooling can also be groundwater, geothermal cooling, or ocean water, which we have here. So on the left-hand side, we have some very large pumps which take the seawater. They then go through extremely large heat exchangers on the right-hand side, and then the seawater flows back to the ocean via gravity via this enormous pipe on my right-hand side. We are reducing the CO2 footprint of the data center because we're not consuming electrical energy to run compressors and using refrigerants to, to, to form cooling. It's an example of free cooling, which is a little bit outside the norm. But the wonderful thing about ocean water is it has a very constant temperature right throughout the year. Whereas if you're using the atmosphere, then you have a very high summer temperature, a very low winter temperature. Yeah, so this is a very attractive model for data centers. We have a constant load, and here we have a constant temperature to offset that. Amsterdam is another very good example. Uh, we have a groundwater storage system where uh, during the colder months we can cool down the groundwater and during the hotter months we take that, that, that stored energy which is cooled and we use it to exchange the heat from the data center back into the groundwater again. Well, sustainability in data centers isn't only about conservation of energy and water, it's also about fitting in with the local environment. And here in Canary Wharf we have a very dense urban area um, so what we've gone for here is we've gone for a dock water cooling system. We have a very large volume of water beneath us and we will use this water with its high thermal capacity for the energy transfer from heat from the technical area in the data center. Yeah, so we can build a large capacity data center in a very densely occupied area uh, without causing visual impacts or noise or, or, or other negative effects. There are concepts emerging in the market which we are supporting and researching which look at the junction temperature of the integrated circuits themselves and they reject the heat at that location direct to a, to a liquid uh, which we then can, can, can transfer further to, in this case, the cooling water. Yes, yeah, so the nice thing about these two concepts as well as using an absolute minimal amount of energy, we also have a minimal impact on this inner city environment. We're in one of the main chilled water plant rooms of our largest London data centre. It's called Powergate. Uh, this room is interesting because this is where we exchange the heat from the IT equipment in the data centre and move it to atmosphere. And for, in terms of environmental friendliness and energy efficiency, the important thing is to take cognizance of the ambient conditions. We exchange the heat from the data centre uh, into a water circuit, which then goes uh, to high level and is emitted to atmosphere, which means we don't run mechanical plant. We have a lower electrical power requirement and overall we reduce our CO2 footprint for the data center. We're certainly uh, at the front of the market in terms of uh, cooling efficiency and efficiency of cooling systems. So I guess you could call it an environmental characteristic of London that does rain quite a lot and we therefore collect rainwater. So where the rainfall normally 
will actually fall to the ground and evaporate naturally to the atmosphere. In this case, we collect it with our rainwater harvesting system. So we store the rainwater for a short period of time and then evaporate it, collecting heat from the data centre at the same time. And this is a heat rejection concept which has a minimal effect on the environment. The free cooling elements that we can make available and make use of have an enormous effect on reducing our CO2 footprint and improving our energy efficiency. We are uh, environmentally accredited. Uh, any companies which take cognizance of or are accredited to these European norms will benefit from moving into our data centre because they then also enjoy the same accreditations. There is a commercial advantage which we enjoy which we can pass on to our customers as well. I do find, uh, find it very rewarding to, to have a new environmental concept and to demonstrate that it works effectively and, and to be able to make it a commercial reality.